good evening, everyone, and I uh, would like to thank um, uh, my hosts, uh, the, uh, of course, the Australian National University, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Canberra, and uh, the uh, U.S. Studies uh, Center for uh, bringing me here. Um, it's always fun to talk about a controversial topic, so I look forward to all of your uh, questions and comments. Uh, in November uh, 2011, uh, of course you all know that President uh, Barack Obama announced uh, that his administration would shift uh, its strategic focus away from the wars uh, of the Middle East uh, to the Asia Pacific. And this new uh, strategic balancing um, rebalancing or uh, pivot to Asia as it came to be called um, has evolved. Um, it has come to include a mix of diplomatic, economic, and security related initiatives. It really was not initially a comprehensive coherent strategy. In fact, I would say that there was really no strategy document that was guiding the implementation of strategy. Uh, but it has, uh, it really has evolved uh, into being much, uh, much more coherent. And uh, the, uh, my organization, um, CSIS, was um, actually uh, tasked, uh, the Defense Department commissioned an independent assessment of uh, U.S. force posture in Asia under the mandate of Congress. And uh, CSIS was asked to produce uh, a report uh, that was released last year, and it focused on how to align U.S. force posture to overall U.S. national interests in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and uh, so that study primarily had a military focus, uh, but my, uh, my colleagues who were engaged in that study told me they went looking through the drawers of the Pentagon for the, um, the strategy document um, and didn't find one. <laughs> uh, but. Um, uh, the, um, the origins of, uh, of this um, strategy, I think, in the rethinking and the rebalancing, uh, can be traced uh, to really before President Obama took office. Uh, I know that uh, Sec National Security Advisor uh, Tom Donilon uh, is quite fond of telling the story that uh, advisors uh, to uh, the President before he, he was actually inaugurated uh, would get together and talk about uh, what their priorities would be after they took office. And uh, they asked the question, where is the United States underweighted? Where is the United States overweighted? Um, and it's very clear that the United States has spent a great deal of resources and energy um, in the Middle East uh, and was very much underweighted in Asia, uh, which was increasingly the most economically dynamic area uh, of the world. Now, um, although I use the terms rebalance and pivot uh, interchangeably, um, most U.S. officials do prefer the term rebalance, uh, but the word pivot really, um, I think, sort of took on a life of its own uh, in Washington. Even uh, President Obama has used it. Um, it's generally um, considered to be, uh, to represent an abrupt move, so if, you, if, you, if you're pivoting in one direction, then you're pivoting away from something else, and our European friends and allies in particular uh, did not like the term pivot because they felt that uh, they were being short shrifted. And I think even our allies in Asia felt, well, if we could abruptly sh pivot in one direction, then we might pivot away. Um, and we still hope that that won't happen, although there, I think, still some uneasiness uh, that exists uh, throughout the Asia-Pacific uh, region. Uh, but I think also it's important uh, to underscore that the pivot or rebalance was not just uh, from the Middle East uh, to the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, uh, but even perhaps more importantly is a rebalance uh, from north to south within the Pacific. Um, and that is that we were, have been so concentrated, um, especially militarily, but also to some extent diplomatically on uh, Northeast Asia. And there has very much been a, an emphasis now on uh, Southeast Asia and this region and the, the broader Indo-Pacific, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that later. So I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit about some of the individual components uh, of the rebalance strategy, and I'm going to start by talking about the economic component, which I think is a very underappreciated part of the U.S. rebalance uh, to Asia. Sixty percent of American exports uh, go to the Asia-Pacific region, uh, and by 2025, Asia is projected to account for almost half 
of the world's economic output. Uh, it is certainly clear when President Obama came to power and was facing the global financial crisis that uh, he had to think about where uh, the United States was going to look to to increase our exports uh, and to, um, uh, to increase American jobs. And President Obama announced in March of 2010 uh, that the United States would seek to double its exports to $2 trillion uh, in five years. And this further highlights the importance uh, of the region to the United States economically. The economic component, actually, of the pivot, in my view, um, evolved very slowly. Uh, the Obama administration really didn't have a trade policy, per se, for the first couple of years. Uh, but it has uh, evolved to put a great deal of emphasis on the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. And the United States is working uh, with other Asia-Pacific economies, including Australia, uh, to create the TPP. Uh, based on a shared commitment to high standards, eliminating market access barriers to goods and services, and addressing uh, 21st century uh, trade issues and respecting a rules-based economic framework. So this is very much a platform for regional economic integration. Uh, it is not, of course, the only platform that are being developed. There are others. Uh, ASEAN plus three, uh, China, Japan, Korea, many bilateral FTAs, uh, and, uh, and the RCEP. Um, but these are not mutually exclusive, not necessarily uh, in competition either. I think that all can, can contribute in various ways to promoting trade and regional economic integration. Another economic component of uh, the U.S. rebalancing strategy to Asia is to uh, become more involved in the economic life of the region and support uh, very specific economic uh, projects. And I'm just going to mention a couple of those. Uh, the U.S. established the Lower Mekong Initiative, uh, which seeks to strengthen cooperation in the areas of environment and health and education, infrastructure development in the Lower Mekong region. Uh, there's also a, a, a food security project uh, in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, and the United States is also seeking to promote uh, trade with some of our uh, important partners, such as uh, uh, ASEAN, where we have created what we call the E3, uh, the expanded economic uh, engagement that is designed to expand uh, trade, investment ties, create new business opportunity and jobs in all uh, 11 countries. I want to move now to talk a little bit about the diplomatic components of the uh, rebalancing strategy. And I think that the most important of these is really multilateral region, uh, regional institution building. And in my mind, this is the, one of the newest parts of uh, US policy towards the region. Of course, the United States has been a member of uh, APEC. Uh, we've been uh, participating in the ASEAN Regional Forum. But under the George W. Bush administration, uh, there was a, uh, a discussion within government about whether or not to join the East Asia Summit as it was established. And the decision was made that the United States would stand uh, apart from that organization and be an observer and see what happened and determine sort of later whether or not we should uh, become a member. And when the Obama administration uh, took office, uh, there was a very early decision made that uh, the United States should be involved in shaping uh, the institutions uh, of the region. And so the United States um, uh, signed uh, the TAC and then joined the East Asia uh, Summit um, and wants to basically leverage these, um, these institutions to promote adherence to international laws and norms, uh, respect for freedom of commerce and navigation, uh, and commitment to resolve disputes peacefully and without the threat of, uh, of coercion. Of course, the United States also established the U.S. ASEAN uh, Summit. So regional uh, institution building has been a critically important part of the rebalancing strategy and will remain so uh, going forward. Um, secondly, and I won't go into all of these at length uh, because there are other things that I want to talk about, but I'll just sort of briefly outline what some of these components are. Uh, strengthening our alliance, uh, our alliances in the region, uh, Australia, of course, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, the Philippines, and Thailand, increasing diplomatic coordination and uh, strengthening our security cooperation. 
Uh, the third component is forging deeper partnerships with emerging powers. Uh, and India and Indonesia, I think, are the most important in this, uh, in this regard. The fourth component I will speak um, at greater length about, because that is uh, strengthening our ties with China. And I think that there has been uh, a great deal of misunderstanding, including in China itself, about China's role within the rebalancing strategy. Um, certainly the United States seeks to build a constructive uh, relationship with China uh, while shaping China's rise. And I want to say first we've heard from many senior U.S. officials uh, that the United States uh, strategy towards China is not one of uh, containment. Um, although there are many people in China that seek to characterize U.S. intentions towards China as suppressing its rise, uh, seeking it to prevent it from uh, realizing what Xi Jinping has called the Chinese dream, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. The containment strategy as, uh, as implemented against the former Soviet Union uh, doesn't in any way uh, apply to China. We have massive uh, trade uh, with China. Uh, we have, of course, uh, enormous immigration and people-to-people -people, uh, contacts. U.S. presidents, including President Obama, uh, web welcomed China's emergence as a successful, prosperous, and peaceful nation. And I think it's important to note that a containment strategy, if the United States ever wanted to have one um, against China, could never succeed. There is no country in the region uh, that would want to get on board such a strategy, least of all uh, China's neighbors, who very much benefited and continue to benefit from China's economic rise. China is almost every Asian nation's largest trading partner, um, including Australia's. And so for the United States, um, in order to achieve the objectives of our overall rebalancing to Asia, we have to get China right, uh, or we will not have close relations with our partners and, uh, and our allies. Moreover, I would argue that the United States itself needs a stable, uh, productive, and cooperative uh, relationship with China. I referred earlier to our national security advisor, Tom Donilon, who has given two major speeches on the U.S. rebalancing strategy. The first one was last November, which he gave uh, at my institution at CSIS. And in both of these uh, speeches, he identified cooperation with China as one of the pillars of the U.S. rebalancing strategy. Um, getting along with China, working together where our country's interests overlap are, are truly imperative uh, to advancing broader U.S. interests. And I know that here in Australia there has been a, a debate over the recent uh, defense white paper um, and the different language that was used in 2009 uh, regarding China and the language that is used in the current white paper. And I must admit that when I read through this current white paper, um, what really struck me is that a lot of the language that's used uh, regarding China really echoes that uh, used by the United States and indeed by President Obama. Both the United States and Australia welcome China's rise. Um, neither uh, of our countries believes uh, that any country should be forced to choose between China and the United States. Um, neither of us views China as an adversary. And our policies are aimed, as your white paper says, at encouraging China's peaceful rise and ensuring that strategic competition in the region uh, does not lead uh, to conflict. The U.S. and China um, relationship is really um, unique in many ways. It is indeed both cooperative and competitive. I remember in 2007 there was a, uh, a report on the, it was the uh, Colbert Report, one of our great comedians that satirized China and called China a, a frenemy, both a, uh, a friend and an enemy. And there's really a great deal of truth to that characterization. Uh, the U.S. and China are extremely interdependent economically. Uh, we share many interests in common, but we remain quite, I think, wary of each other's long-term ambitions as well as intentions. The most worrisome aspect of the U.S.-China relationship, I think, um, from the American point of view, um, is, in the, is in the military realm, although also in the economic realm, but I want to talk about the military realm first. Um, it's this 
emerging struggle between China's development of capabilities to deny the U.S. access to the region, to the seas around China in a crisis, um, and the U.S. determination to ensure access, uh, to come to the aid of our allies if needed, uh, to operate in the region uh, with our Navy and our Air Force um, in order to defend peace and stability uh, in the region. And I think this really began in the mid-1990s, but it's a far more serious um, competitive aspect of our relationship now that China's military modernization has made uh, much more progress. China is shifting from a land power uh, to a sea power. Um, it is paranoid about foreign intervention, which is um, explained by its history of invasion by foreign powers in the 19th and 20th centuries, a period that China refers to as its uh, century of national humiliation. Um, now that China is wealthier, it, uh, it wants to be a stronger military, it, it wants to have a stronger military so it can uh, defend its interests. And this is um, a major point of the 18th Party Congress work, work Report, as well as the recently um, released defense uh, white paper in, in China. So um, I also want to mention the, uh, in the economic sphere, uh, we have, again, U.S. and China, very interdependent. We have a great deal of trade. The uh, United States has an enormous amount of investment in China. I will spare you the, the, uh, the figures. Uh, but we have a growing problem uh, on the cyber security area and cyber espionage. Uh, where uh, we have entities in China that are stealing um, intellectual property. And so our president has called for a level playing field uh, in, uh, with China. And U.S. companies are not the only companies to suffer from, uh, from that kind of uh, challenge from, from China. And indeed, the United States is working closely with our allies and friends uh, in the cybersecurity area. Um, another worrisome problem uh, is China's assertive behavior in the region. We really saw this uh, begin in about uh, 2009, uh, where China is, uh, was seen to be putting greater pressure uh, on some of its neighbors, uh, particularly those with which it has uh, territorial disputes. Um, I believe that this in part resulted from an assessment at the time uh, in China that the United States was facing a great deal of uh, uh, of pressure economically is the global financial crisis. Uh, U.S. power was seen by many as having peaked and potentially in decline. Um, and I think that there was some hubris in China about narrowing the gap very quickly uh, with the United States and some testing of the waters uh, and putting pressure on some uh, of its neighbors, some of which were U.S. closest allies. And the example that I would point to was uh, in uh, 2010, uh, when there was an arrest of a Chinese fisherman by the Japanese, um, and the Chinese sought to uh, curtail the export of uh, rare earth minerals uh, to Japan. It turned out, I think, to be a rather counterproductive uh, action. Uh, but we saw similar economic coercion used by China against the Philippines uh, last year in the Scarborough Shoal uh, incident. And so I think there are worries uh, in the United States about how China is going to use this great uh, leverage uh, that it has over, over other countries, particularly uh, in the economic uh, realm. Uh, so I want to speak very briefly about um, the military elements uh, of the rebalancing strategy, which many people believe are the sort of core uh, of, the, uh, of the rebalance, uh, but I think it's just a portion of it. Um, and as I said, uh, the United States um, Navy has sailed over and under the seas without challenge for centuries uh, and is determined to maintain its access to international waters uh, and preserve freedom of navigation for all seafaring nations. Uh, and uh, so we have, uh, the U.S. is seeking a broader distribution of forces in this, re in, in this region while maintaining presence, of course, in Japan uh, and Korea. We are enhancing uh, some of our uh, access arrangements and our presence in Southeast Asia and here in Australia. We are increasing the flexibility of the U.S. defense posture, again, to ensure that, the, that U.S. forces can operate freely and strengthening uh, our partners' capabilities, and that is a very critical part 
uh, of the rebalancing strategy, uh, to work with other nations, uh, provide more training and more exercises. One example is in the Philippines, um, which is a country that has been very internally focused in terms of seeing its threats and recently is looking now more outward, wanting to have more situational, situational awareness uh, to uh, maintain uh, a defense of its own uh, waters, including its, uh, its, uh, for its uh, fishermen. So, of course, President Obama announced um, here uh, that a marine expeditionary unit would rotate through Australia. Um, and, uh, of course, we are beginning to deploy literal combat ships in Singapore, um, up to four of them. We deployed the first one a few, I think, weeks ago. Uh, and U.S. forces are talking with uh, the Philippines also about uh, rotational presence and enhanced access. And our defense secretary, um, at the uh, Shangri-La Dialogue uh, last year, uh, declared that the uh, percentage of our Navy ships deployed in the region would increase to 60% by 2020. That's a net increase, I think, of about 22 platforms. Um, we should note that Chinese ships will probably, by 2020, increase to three or four times uh, that number. Um, our Air Force capabilities will also increase in the Asia Pacific, uh, and while budget Cuts um, for U.S. military deployments will certainly take place in other parts of the world, and we can talk about sequestration if you wish, though it would certainly put me to sleep. Um, uh, President Obama has pledged to uh, not reduce money uh, spent for defense in Asia. So if I were to sum up what the United States is doing in this region uh, militarily, I would say the overarching goal is to, uh, to win the peace. So, uh, as President Obama stated, I'm here in Canberra, uh, U.S. goals in the region are to sustain a stable security environment uh, and a regional order rooted in economic openness, peaceful resolution of disputes, and respect for universal rights uh, and freedoms. To achieve these goals, uh, the U.S. is clear that uh, we have to have greater economic engagement. We have to strengthen our, the multilateral architecture here in this region and our partnerships, use more of our soft power in addition to executing uh, a military rebalance. Uh, as I said today, almost every country in the region uh, is somewhat apprehensive uh, about China's rise. Uh, Every country in the region, I think uh, virtually every country, wants closer ties with the United States. This is something, again, our, our National Security Advisor Donilon refers to as the demand signal in the region. Um, we've had many, many leaders, senior officials, uh, come to Washington, talk to our President, um, our Secretary of State, and our Secretary of Defense, and urge the United States to be more present. Uh, in this region, because there is uncertainty about China's growing power, even as no country wants to have to choose uh, between the United States and China. Probably the most important foreign policy goal of the 21st century um, is to figure out how to work together, coexist with China in the Asia Pacific region. Um, this is a great challenge for the United States. Um, it is extremely important um, that the U.S. cooperate uh, with China in the region. No country has written, risen to great power status as rapidly uh, as China has in, it, in its history. Uh, it rivals and surpasses the rise of the United States in the early uh, part of last century. But China's rise is different in many respects. Uh, China rises to great power status with still a very large percentage of its population living in poverty. Um, with a determined set of economic goals and objectives um, and still some ambivalence about what sort of role it wants to play on the international stage. I think we continue to see China's leadership as um, basically insecure. Um, concerned potentially not only about threats externally, but perhaps even more importantly, threats internally. But I do want to underscore again, um, the United States welcomes China's rise, but we do hope uh, that it will emerge in a peaceful way, uh, not threaten the interests of its neighbors, uh, and contribute in positive ways to addressing regional and global problems. 
One of the challenges that we face with China um, is that it actually, I think, it continues to be uh, a rather selfish or self-centered power. Uh, China has risen um, or is rising to greatness um, very quickly and is very concerned about meeting its own goal of building comprehensive national power. Uh, again, the Chinese dream, the resurgence of China as a nation, and is very reluctant to take on greater responsibility regionally and globally. And ironically, although some people again say the US wants to exclude China or we want to contain China, the reality is that we have been trying to encourage China to take on greater responsibility. And some of you may have heard um, in the prior administration under George W. Bush, uh, his um, deputy secretary of state, Bob Zellick at the time, encouraged China to be a responsible uh, stakeholder. Um, and that's something that even though we don't use that language now under the Obama administration, uh, probably that's because um, new presidents and officials come to power and they hate to use the same lexicon that was used by their predecessors. But um, the reality is in private, uh, Obama administration officials continue to use uh, that goal in dealing with China. We want China to be uh, a responsible uh, stakeholder. We would like to see China act in ways that will strengthen the international system uh, rather than undermine it. Um, we hope they will assume greater responsibility, especially for promoting stability in this region. Um, China has, in fact, been free riding in some ways uh, on, on others, and so we hope that they will contribute more. I think America's vision is for a China that integrates into the global community in such a way uh, that there are shared norms, uh, values, uh, and procedures. Uh, and I think that there is willingness and openness in the United States to continue to modify and perfect, improve the, um, the international system with China as a participant in that process. Um, and that's something that I think U.S. officials are always conveying uh, to Chinese officials uh, as well. So this is very much a work in progress. And I would close by saying that the importance that the United States attaches to the relationship with China is very clearly demonstrated by a decision that was just made by President Obama and announced a few days ago to have uh, an early summit uh, with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Initially, the plan had been that our two presidents uh, would not meet until September uh, on the sidelines of the G20. And uh, there were many experts in Washington, including myself, uh, who uh, strongly advocated uh, an early meeting between our presidents. Uh, it is important, I think, it, between any two countries to have a rapport between leaders but particularly between uh, the U.S. and China, uh, because China is really very much of a top-down system. And you, if you can have a consensus between your leaders, uh, you can give clear instructions to your bureaucracies, identify some things that you're going to work on, that this can really build uh, momentum. And so I think it's especially important early on in, since Xi Jinping will be ruler in China for 10 years, uh, and Obama, of course, uh, is serving his uh, second term in office, there is so much uh, that we really need to do together uh, with China. Um, there is no problem in the world, as I think President Obama said in his first term, that can be solved uh, exclusively by the U.S. and China. Uh, but whatever problem there is out there, uh, global climate change, proliferation, certainly North Korea and Iran being two uh, very important examples, the U.S. and China need to work together um, in order to help to address those problems. And so I'm very much um, uh, uh, reassured that a decision has been made uh, for our two presidents um, not to just uh, meet for an hour on the sidelines of a multilateral meeting, but to sit down for, I believe it's a, a day and a half of meetings uh, in California, a real in-depth discussion about all of the issues in our bilateral, regional, and indeed uh, increasingly global uh, relationship. Um, and I think that it will have the effect of not only strengthening the U.S.
relationship, but also perhaps uh, reassuring people around the world and countries and leaders uh, that the United States takes this relationship very, um, very seriously. Um, and that we understand that the rest of the world is watching, uh, that this is a relationship that we need to manage uh, well. Uh, and so with that, I'm happy to take your questions.